Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today's Open Alex webinar is going to be a part one of a two part series on Open Alex APIs. The first part is going to be a getting started, sort of an introduction to using APIs generally, but more specifically the Open Alex API. And then in two weeks, the next webinar, part two, is actually going to be coding with my colleague Jason Portnoy, who's joining here. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, we will answer live questions in the chat while I'm speaking. My colleague Jason Portnoy will, but I'll also stop the recording at the end of the presenta presentation so we can have a more interactive dialogue. All right, so presentation at the glance today, starting from the top, an intro to using APIs generally and what they are and why you would use them, and then going straight into the Open Alex API, the basics of building calls and getting responses back, and then something I want to spend some time on is how you can leverage our new user interface when you're new learning APIs. So I think this is something that, that's really exciting, and I want to make sure to spend some time on it. And then at the end, I'll point you to some additional resources to, to continue le learning. Okay, so first, if you didn't know what API stands for, Application Programming Interface, there's a lot of ways of thinking about this, but the way that I think about it is instead of you directly interacting with our user interface, an API is a program directly interacting with our data instead of you. That's kind of a simplistic way of, of looking at it. There is still a user involved because the user needs to do some coding to tell the computer how to talk to our servers, but um, essentially it's cutting out that, that middleman. A, a quick chart um, to, to think about when you would use the API versus a graphic user interface. On the left axis here, you can see uh, we've got ease of use. Graphic user interface are designed to be intuitive for most users. That's the entire point. Um, whereas APIs requ require some coding skills. So not everyone is able to just start using API. There is some coding skill needed and that's a, a major barrier for a lot of people. But in terms of analyses supported, the graphic user interface really only supports the ones that the designers program it to support. Um, whereas using an API, you can do just about anything imaginable. So it's much more powerful, but it does require some coding, some coding skills. In terms of exports, I put this here because a lot of people ask about different types of data that you can get. Um, the graphic user interface, you really get static or flat files, more like a, a, a database. Whereas the API um, is better for sort of knowledge graphs. And what I mean by that is you can download a list of works, but each of those works has a list of references cited within it or authors. And then with API, you can go collect more information on those pieces within that file to get the whole network instead of just a flat file. And then in terms of integrations, um, I know some folks have been using the graphic user interface to download works lists and then have another program read that, like Microsoft um, Power BI or Tableau. So basically, if you're going to do that, you need to be able to download this from the, from the UI manually and, and overwrite those existing files. Whereas API, there's a possibility for live updates with most softwares now that allow some sort of API interface. So that's just a high level of, of when you would use one over the other. Um, to, to spend a moment on the Open Alex API, it is free. And I wanna make sure that uh, just like, that you know that just like all the other ways you can access our data, the data dump is free, the graphic user interface is free, the API is also free. And it doesn't require authentication, but you'll see I put a, a bullet here to say, but there are two pools here. There's the pool without any sort of email, um, and then that's the common pool and what we call the polite pool. And the difference here is that if you put your email um, in the API call, you'll usually get faster and more consistent responses. But without any sort of um, authentication or subscription, you're able to get up to 100,000 calls per day and up to 10 calls per second. So these are incredibly generous. These are um, more generous than most of the paid subscriptions that even when you pay for their API service. So we're really excited about that. But we do know that people need sometimes more than that. And we have some organizations that are using millions of API calls a day. Um, so a couple things on this. First at the bottom, you'll see, we raise limits for free to support research projects. So if you're a researcher in an institution and you're doing a research project and you need more data than you can get from the user interface, but maybe less than you need from the data dump, um, reach out to us and we can have a conversation about what limits you need and get you a key that fits that. 
But there's also, and I have to spend a moment on this, a paid or premium version of API. And the difference here is that there's an API key that we issue you that gets linked to your account. And API limits are raised to meet your needs. Now, I said on that last slide, 100,000 API calls a day, which is very generous and meets most needs. Uh, but some people, like I said, need up to millions a day. And we are able to, to meet those needs, but um, we do that through the premium service. And I just want to add that there's two other filters that are only available to premium subscribers in API. Uh, this from created date and from updated date. And the reason we have these two is that if somebody downloads the snapshot, which we release monthly for free of all the Open Alex data, you can actually use APIs to stay in sync with those, um, with our data, with our database, so that you can have hourly updates of the full database instead of just monthly that's available for free. So I just wanted to get that out of the way and make sure everyone knew that there are those two different versions. For most use cases, you'll be able to get everything you need using the completely free, unauthenticated API. And one of the things that I really love about this is all of our documentation online is very strong. And we have people who have built derivative tools off our API um, all around the world without even contacting us, which is great because it shows how good that documentation is. And you can find it all at docs.openalex.org. And you'll see over on the left, um, there's API entities where you can learn more about what's available for each of the entities, what fields you can filter and search and, and group by. But then down at the bottom left, you'll see there's how to use the API. And that's where there's detailed information. And just to give you a context, I'm not a strong coder, but I was able to use everything on that website to put together today's webinar. And that's where you can go to find more information on the things that I'm talking about. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to say is I'm not going to be doing any Python coding today. The, the second webinar will have actual Python coding and learning the API in, in these types of analyses, but I am going to show how it works using a web browser. And any API call you can type into a web browser. You see I put copy and paste into any browser here, and that's true, but there's an asterisk here. And that asterisk is that some web browsers will return it as one really long data um, string and you can't really read it. So one of the things that I've done, you can see I've got extensions here. I've downloaded an extension called JSON view that allows me to view uh, API calls and responses in a way that's a little bit better looking. So for this example here, api.openalps.org forward slash counts. I'm just gonna show that one. This is one of my favorites because at any time you can go on to open Alex, do this API and you'll get a current call of, of all of the, the data that we have. So you can see here, for instance, right now we have 251 million works. And this format is using that JSON view um, that, I, that I had as an extension. If you don't have this, it's going to be one really long string. So consider getting something like that. OK, but for all of this, I'm going to be going through and copy and pasting in the browser so that we can see how the call is formulated and then what the response looks like, just to give some of the basics. So first, getting a single entity via an API. The, you probably already noticed in that URL that it was api.openalex.org instead of openalex.org. Um, and here you can see the general format for getting a single entity is api.openalex.org forward slash the entity name forward slash the entity ID. And I've given you three examples here of things you can call for. So this first is the country and the country code for Canada. So if I click this, You'll see the API call up here is api.openalex.org forward slash countries forward slash Canada. And it's bringing back all of the information that we have on Canada. Is it part of the Global South, the works counted, cited by, um, and quite a bit more information. And the same thing works with authors. So you'll see here we've got authors and then an author ID. And this is the author profile for Jason Priam, the founder and CEO of, of our research. Um, and you can see it's got all the information that we have on, on him as an author in here, including previous affiliations, citations, um, a lot of information. You can see how far I can scroll down to get that information. And then the last one I want to point out is works. So the idea here is I, I've said, give me this work with this work ID. This work ID is the first publication where we launched Open Alex, um, just as an example, but you can see here it's bringing back all the information on that specific work only. Um, another thing I really like about this JSON viewer is you're able to collapse some of this um, to be able to, to look at it more easily. 
Okay, so that's generally how it works to get a single entity via an API, but you can also get a list of entities from an API. And as an example here, um, and I, I've chosen topics because a lot of people ask, how many topics are there? What are all the topics? If you just do api.openalex.org forward slash topics, it's going to bring up, and you can see there was a moment where it showed the old version before it deconstructed it and put it in that nicer view, um, just to show you how much better it is when you do have a reader like this. But you can see now it's telling me there's 4,516 topics, um, and then it goes through and lists each topic. So this first one here, territorial governance and environmental participation, um, it's got keywords associated with that topic, the different IDs, the subfield it belongs to, the field, the domain, sibling topics. So quite a bit of information about that topic. And one thing I didn't mention earlier that I do want to mention now is for these API calls, you can see the URL is actually very similar to what it would be if you use the graphic user interface. And I think always, but most of the time at least, you're able to just delete that openalex.org or that API part and type in just openalex.org and it will bring up that exact same call in the user interface. It's taking a little bit uh, longer to load at the moment. Oh, I just did topics. Let me get, um, let me get one on the specific work. So this is gonna bring up that specific work. Open Alex, a fully open index of scholarly works. And all I did was, was remove the API dot at the beginning and it shows it in the user interface. And I'm going to go back to that in a, uh, in a little bit to talk about how you can do the flip where you use the user interface to come up with API calls. But most of the work that people do in API, uh, in the OpenAlex API, starts with this root of api.openalex.org forward slash works. And the reason why is this is returning the entire list of works in OpenAlex. So if I click on this, I'm going to get rid of some of these uh, tabs. You can see that there's 251 million works, and it's going to start getting all of the information on those works. So this is quite a lot of information, but from there, you use that as a route to add on more things to filter the specific works that you're looking for. And I'll, I'll give some examples of that. In previous webinars, we've talked about this really simple but elegant model of you build filters to get a subset, and then you do analyses by counting by these different fields. Here's an example where I have three different filters that I want to look at. Um, I have an institution that I care about, a topic that I care about in a year, and I'm going to apply those filters to get all the publications matching that, that search. And so you can see I've built that down here at the bottom, but the important route that I talked about, api.openalex.org forward slash works, is visible. But then you can also see I've put in bold filter to show that I'm applying now filter. And then the underlying parts are the three different filters I've applied. So um, authorship, institution lineage. So this is an institution uh, primary topic ID and publication year. But if I click that, just to give you a sense of what, what I'm looking at, just bear with it a moment you can see there's 179 works that match that. Now, um, if, if you're like me and you've put together this presentation and you've forgotten exactly what all of the IDs are that you put in here, one great thing that you can do is just delete that API at the beginning and do openalex.org uh, forward slash works and keep the rest of it. And you'll see that institution was Simon Fraser University. The topic was fuel cell membrane technology and the years I put were 2018 um, forward. So that's uh, as, as simple as, as that gets, and I'll show a couple more examples of how you can be more nuanced with that, but that's the general idea here. But let's say you only want specific fields, because when I did this earlier, you can see there's a lot of information, and that's why it's taking it so long to load in here, but maybe you only want specific fields, and you don't need all of the information that we have available. And you can do that with, you can see I've now put this in bold with the select. So in here, you see we've got um, 179 works with all of their information. So for this first work, you can see ID, DOI, title, display name, and it goes on. There's a ton of information here. But let's say I only wanted the DOI title and cited by count. You can pick whichever fields you want, of course, but this is just an example. If I click that and all it's done is added this select at the end, you can see here I've added that with an and sign. And now it's only giving me for each result, the DOI, the title, and the cited by count. 
And this can be really helpful, especially if you just need one piece of data, you don't need all of it. Um, it'll download much more quickly that way. Okay, the next thing I wanna point out is that I said it's returning a lot of information, especially when you use just the forward slash works and it brings back the 250 million works, but, but anytime it's over 25 works, you're gonna have to do what's called paging through. Now, if you've used the user interface before, you know that it shows the first 10 or 20 results and then you have to click page two. It's the same idea with the API. So you'll see here on the left, this is what I was getting earlier. It told me the count was 179 works and the page was page one and the per page is 25. And this is the default. So even when you don't put these in as parameters, you don't specify the page, you don't specify the, the amount per page, it's going to do that as default. But you can change those, uh, those features in your API call. So you'll see here at the top, um, maybe if I go back a slide, you can see when I entered that in, I didn't even put page one, but that was the assumption that it built in. But if I now change that to page two, and then per page I put 100, um, you'll see in, in the response call on the right, it's now giving me all of the works, the, the 100 works on that second page. Now here there was only 179 total works, so that means that second page is only going to have 79 works on it, but that's how you would go through and get all of the works that you need. A quick point to say here, 25 is default and it's usually sufficient for most needs. The maximum is 200 and that's a technical limitation. So there are ways of, um, of automating that process so that you can, with a script, say, give me every page for 200. And I'm sure that's one of the use cases my colleague will, will demo in two weeks in part two, um, but did wanna to point that out. Okay, so that's the most common uh, sort of way people are using this is let's find all of the specific works and, and bring back the information on them. But we've talked a lot about in previous webinars, not ending with that list of results, but then counting by certain uh, fields within that or certain entities within that list to figure out who are the top contributing countries, who are the top contributing institutions in that particular field. And that logic, just as a reminder, is you create filters and then you group by those same metadata fields. So an example here I chose as a filter, a sustainable development goal, whether or not something was open access and a specific country. And if you look down at the bottom at the API call, you can see my group by here is authorship.institutions.lineage. Um, so that's gonna group by or do my analysis by institution. And then these filters that I've applied are sustainable development goal 14, which I believe is life below water. Open access is true. So these are only open access works on STG 14 with an author from Canada. Just to give you an example of what that looks like, um, you'll see now it's returning the top works. So I had specified it had to have a Canadian author. So it's not surprising to see the government of Canada is really high up here. The University of British Columbia has a strong uh, fisheries and oceans department. Um, Natural Resources Canada, University of Toronto. These are some of the, the institutions I would have expected to be up at the top. And this is just uh, what I showed live just, just moments ago. And this same logic will apply to any of the research amount, uh, use cases you have. Um, let me just see. Okay, so this is a good point where I want to switch and talk about how you can leverage the, the UI when you're learning API. So I showed you a couple examples that you can get started, and you can copy and paste the different fields that you want into these calls, but there's a much better way of doing it. Um, and maybe in the Q&A, my colleague um, Jason will help point to a link where you can find the full list of all of the fields you can get, but it is under that docs.openalex.org. You are able to find that full list of fields you're able to, to filter and count by. Um, but just as an example, here are four use cases I want to show. So getting more data from an entity than you can get on the user interface. So if I go to openalex.org, and let's say, for instance, uh, I type in my name, Kyle Demas. I'm going to look at my author profile. This is bringing up all of my works, but maybe if I look at my individual author profile, you'll see we've selected some of the information we think people want to see. And this is that whole challenge of user interfaces, is we, we have to design this in a way that we think maximizes its use, but some people will need more information, and we have more information than we display here. And so one way that you can do that um, is by viewing the API. 
So throughout Open Alex, we do have the ability to click view the API call, um, but you probably noticed, I'm just gonna go back to this page. The only difference here from an API call is that it doesn't have API dot at the beginning. So if you add API dot, you will be able to, to get that information. And now you can see more information about this entity than we were able to display um, on the, the user interface. And people do this a lot with works because there's a lot more information about works that we have through the API that we don't have uh, on the user interface. But that's one really common example. Um, the next one is turning a complex query into API calls. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So if you are new to API, you've probably been using user interfaces um, quite a bit. And if you wanna start um, training on APIs or doing something with that, you probably will start by building your query in Open Alex. Um, so I'm gonna just create one that's Journal of Psychology. Uh, and then I'm going to add uh, Canadian authors. Oops, I've got something in the way on my screen. Okay. And then I'm going to specify on this specific topic, microalgae as a source for biofuels. Um, and then maybe I'm going to say they have to be articles. And maybe that's a good place to start now. But you can see in this query, I've just clicked through and I've added four different, oh, the type isn't loading here. This is a bug that will get fixed. Um, but that type was article. You can see that here. So I've added four different filters in here. And each time I've done that, the URL up here has updated. Now, the, the best way to get the API query, once you've built something in the, the user interface, is to go up here to this um, sort of settings looking or, or uh, gear icon. If you click that, there's the API query. And you'll see it's going to pop up a new box that has that. And this is how you would construct that API query. So you can then copy that and then paste that directly into the URL. And now it's returning those same results. So you'll see there were 72 results here, there's 72 results here. But it's only displaying the first page with 25. So if you did want to be able to change that, so let's say I wanted page three, um, you're going to see it's, it's going to bring back information on the works that were on page three of that. Okay, so that's another really common example. And this, I said complex queries, this is actually quite a simple one, but you could do one that is much more complex than that in this same idea and then get the API query from there. And the nice part about this is if you're working with someone who um, has some coding skills and they need the API query to then do something with, like they're gonna build an integration into a website or they're gonna do some downstream analytics with it, you can build the query and send them that API call and then they can program with it. Okay, so generate the API calls for count by queries. So I showed you just the very simple example of, of doing a search and then find the results. But let's say you wanted as well to get the count by for the same query. Um, so let's say I want the, the count by institution. So you can click up here on the, the stats or the count by sort of side of the results page. Um, and if you click that, one of the options here is view an API. And if I click that, it's going to bring back that same information. So you might remember University of British Columbia, University of Toronto, Government of Canada. These are some of the, the top in there. And there were the 72 works again, but this is grouping them by their institution. Now, if you wanted to group them by something else, um, remember these are the as a user interface, these are the few that we put up here that we think people want to see most often, but you can use this plus sign up here to find just about any of our metadata fields. So let's say you wanted to know um, sustainable development goal, for instance. You can add that here. Life below water, for instance, this isn't surprising because I chose a journal that is on uh, marine organisms. But if you click this, you can uh, view an API and now you'll see it's added group by SDGs and it's telling you how many contribute to each SDG. That's the general way that all of this works. But this last um, example here that I wanna show is one of my favorites because I'm a novice coder and this really helps me. Um, if I have an idea of what I'm looking for, like let's say um, I wanted to, let's, let's say I wanted to, um, to, to add a topic instead of the primary location that I was looking at, you can, of course, go back here and, and add that topic and then copy and paste the URL. 
but you can also break the URL. So let's say uh, primary location. I don't want that anymore. I'm just going to delete that and hit enter. And the error response is, I think, one of the most helpful error responses I've ever seen. Um, invalid query parameters, because this weird word that I made up is not actually something you can query, but here are all the works that you can query. So let's say you were looking for our new topics, but you weren't sure what the actual API name for them is. Here's all the different things that you can do. So let's say I want to look at primary topic ID. I'm just going to override. Well, for the filter, you would need, um, for, this will work for the group by, but for the filter, you would need to know then which topic um, you are going to, um, you're going to filter by. So you can see here for the source ID, I have a source ID number, uh, but that's something then that, that you would be able to do. So let me just go back to this one. So if I break what you can count by, we should see the same thing. These are all the things that you can now count by. So let me get primary topic. Um, primary topic ID, great. And instead of counting by sustainable development goal, I'm going to, and you can see it's given me now a, so this, this one only has one response because I forgot I had built into the filter a specific topic. So they had to be on this topic. And then I said count by topic. And so there was only one result there, but that's how that works. Um, and we've designed the user interface intentionally to be the seamless integration with our API. Um, one, because it's it's practical and very easy to use that way, but two, so that it can help people who are starting to use API and we can better support. Um, sometimes there's librarians who are building really complex queries and then they want to send it to a programmer. So we want to really support that use case, but I have found this incredibly easy um, to make the jump to start learning APIs. And I, I hope that you'll find that as well. Some other resources to get you started. Um, these are not developed by us, but these are libraries that have been developed by users of OpenAlex. Um, you can see there's some in R, um, Kotlin, Python. Um, these have all been developed to use the OpenAlex API. And there's great resources online walking through specific use cases of how to do that in these programs. So if you're familiar with R already doing your analyses and you want to be able to get integrations for the API to pull the data you need for the analyses, this, this is something that can get you started right away. And the last thing I want to point out here is, is Boss Viewer. Boss Viewer is a very popular all around the world um, research analytics and visualization platform that's free and open. We had a previous webinar from the developer of Boss Viewer who talked about their OpenAlex integration. So put that link here. If you haven't seen it and you want to learn it, definitely check it out. Um, but one of the, the, the benefits of this is because OpenAlex is open, you don't need sort of a any sort of authentication or license to be able to use it, they can build these great integrations with our API. And as an example, all you need to do in Voss Viewer is open it, click Create, um, and then create a map of bibli bibliographic data. You click by APIs, and the very first thing that pops up is OpenAlex. You can scroll down and find other servers, but OpenAlex is there. And then you can copy and paste the API query into here. Um, and then just start doing the analyses from the call. And so you don't have to download the data yourself. This is an example of that program going and getting the data and bringing it back for the analyses. And just in closing, a final plug here for our upcoming second webinar, um, part two. This is in two weeks, the OpenAlex API part two, diving in, which my colleague Jason Portnoy will be doing. That will be a lot more of roll up the sleeves and start coding in Python using our API. So definitely check that out. Um, here, here's the link for where you can register. This is also the link where you will be able to find the recording of this presentation afterwards as, long, as well as the slides. I hope this was helpful in getting you excited about getting started with API, and I'll stop the recording now and we'll go to live Q&A. All right, thank you.